So thank you for joining us today. Um, this is something that Dr. Hall and I have talked about in the, the difference between appreciative advising and other forms of advising. And we wanted to at least introduce it and how it's related, how we see it's related to student success. And I appreciate your beginning. Um, we're going to, Dr. Hall and I are going to split the slides and um, talk a little bit because the number of people we can have a conversation, it's feel free to ask questions at any time. So, Thanks, um, Dr. Zanskas, and good afternoon, colleagues. We appreciate your time for joining us today. Um, Dr. Zanskas has done an amazing job of sort of organizing thoughts um, to guide our discussion today, and I'm really more of, a, of an assistant sort of helping in to, to sort of break up the conversations. But we wanted to begin by asking you, um, what word comes to mind when you think of the word advising? Uh, maybe a different word when we would think of advising. And if you would place that in the chat, we'd love just to see a, a, a flow of your thoughts and ideas um, when it comes to advising. We'll give just a moment to see some of those. Helping, support, care, coaching, scaffolding, directing. Any others? Providing counsel, developmental, awesome, ladder to success. Very nice. Wow. And so all of those are, are, are in line in, in terms of what we look at modeling. Um, as we're working on uh, thinking about appreciative advising, it's just sort of have a common framework, providing counsel to students. All those things are associated in one way or another uh, in our work as advisors and the work we, we are charged with also providing for our students. Um, the next slide asks a slightly different question and just brings into an, a perspective as we transition to um, appreciative advising. If you're able to advance the slide. Oh, I, so it's this, it, can you see it or I'll have to stop sharing and try it again? Okay, it did not advance. Okay. Is it a yeah. different? Okay, <laughs> thank you. So, so the, the question asks, and sort of like in this hypothetical scenario, um, if you were advising um, the president's um, child, uh, president of university, a son or daughter, how would you advise them? And, and how would you want them to feel after working with you as a result of that experience? I'd um, love to hear your, your thoughts and ideas. And I mean, if, if you happen to be assigned, if they were a, a major in one of our degree programs and, and you happen to be assigned to be their advisor, um, not that it should matter, um, but, but just for this hypothetical situation, it, 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 it would be you um, there advising um, one of those students. Um, how would you want them to feel as a result of their experience with you? And you may place it in the chat, or Stephen, we can go back to the large group. You may even raise your hand and would love to just share uh, your sure. thoughts and ideas in, in the large group setting. You would want them to feel that all of the, the questions were answered, um, would want them to leave feeling positive. Um, thorough support, timely interaction, personal connection, you would want them to, to feel that you were knowledgeable in, in your work and what you were advising them in. Wanted them to feel supported, um, but also challenged. Um, good advisors help you grow. Um, all those are, are, are exceptional thoughts and, and, and ideas regarding that. And, and that sort of leads the sense of, you know, as we look into uh, appreciative advising, is having that type of experience for all of our students, regardless of if they happen to be uh, uh, the president's child, um, or, or, or anyone that had an affiliation or, or relationship of, of someone that may be important um, in our workplace or, or in your own life. Um, and, and, and one of the things is we're mindful of that as we go forward is to say, how can we ensure that we can provide that same type of experience for every student in our college, for every student in your degree program area, for every student that you are charged um, with advising, we want them to feel, again, uh, as Crystal is sharing, we want them to feel valued, heard, challenged, supported. 
and that they have practical action steps to follow up a- afterwards. And so all of those things are great and in line. And that's the part of where we're getting at with appreciative advising is having that a, a, a appreciative attention that is given to all of our students. And that does take time. It does take an attention, uh, 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 granting them your attention and the level of effort that's required. But our, our, all of our students should, should not receive anything less. So um, Dr. Zanska is, is going to transition a bit more to give sort of a more formal definition of appreciative advising and then also in, and to give us a sense of a self-assessment of where we fall on, on that continuum as well. Thank you, Dr. Hall. Hold on, I pressed the wrong button. As... So... I included here the definition of appreciative advising, and every I'll allow everybody to read it. But for me, it's really um, very similar to a counseling approach. You know, as a counselor, I ask, um, I do ask occasionally close-ended questions, but often they are open-ended. Oops. <laughs> Um, so it's a student-centered approach, and it really does emphasize the value of each student, and it's this sense of a, it's a privilege to work with the students and also a responsibility. And that responsibility is shared with us and with our, our students. So I won't, I won't read through the whole slide, but there's the definition. And this comes from Bloom and Hudson Key in 2008. So if you're thinking about, and there's a difference between administrative advising and appreciative advising. And, and everybody here, it looks like that all of you that are participating have some sense of appreciative advising already just by looking at the answers you provided in the, in the chat. But here's a, a little inventory that um, Bloom and her colleagues had used to help you determine how appreciative are you in this process. And you don't have to um, say what your scores are, but here are the each items. Um, there are six items. And for each one that you would answer that that describes you, you would have one point. And the higher the number, the more appreciative you are in your advising. And I'll just give you a minute to look at that um, in the items. I care for and believe in the potential of each student. You have an attitude of gratitude. You acknowledge that you can always become better recognizing your position comes with power and responsibility. You're really interested in your students and enjoy learning from them. And you're intentionally aware of those and responsive to cultural differences. So if you had all six, you'd have six points and they'd describe you as a more appreciative advisor. So then we get down to the why of appreciative advising. Dr. Hall, I well, think. And, yeah, and, and why is that important as we have sort of the self-reflection? And if Dr. Zess can go back to the previous slide to see, again, those attributes of, of appreciative advisors um, and, and sort of just from a standpoint of how appreciative are we uh, in our roles, uh, our various roles of working with students. Um, why are these attributes important? Why is it important for us to kind of give an, a self-reflection or, or to have a uh, to, to, to have a self-assessment of where we are on this, uh, among these attributes and uh, in, in fact, in, impacting our service role in working with students. Why would this be important? Or why is this important to you? If we may frame the question differently, um, why are these attributes important to you? For those of you who have scored maybe a five or six, um, you, you've had indications of, of all of those attributes. Why, why, why is that so for you? What is your framework or, or your, your perspective that you take when you're working with students? Um, that why do you do what you do when you interact with students in this way? We have a hand up uh, from uh, from Jeannie. Yes. You're on, You're on mute. mute. <laughs> I do that all the time. I'm very sorry. Hi, everybody. I'm Jeannie Bettenfort. I'm 
a new assistant professor in adult and higher higher and adult education. Uh, so a lot of my work is around student success for undergraduate students, uh, particularly around like marginalized student populations. And I was reading this, it made me think about um, some of the work that I've done around validation, which is a theory by uh, Laura Rendon, and it talks about students essentially coming on campus with all of these assets and like how do we as staff or faculty like uh, support them with that in mind that they are bringing the, this wealth of resources. Um, and so for me, like it really comes down to an equity issue and thinking about like, you know, how am I helping students like utilize the power of higher education without perpetuating like these uh, stratification pieces that can like just weigh like who deserves to be here, who should be here, whose culture is valued. Like I see a lot of synergy in this with that. That's very good. Uh, and I think part of it as, as we're working to, to be mindful of those perspectives as we're working to engage with our students and um, that it affects our decision-making, uh, the strategies that we take of how we interact with them and also how we, uh, again, just demonstrate appreciation for who they are as individuals, appreciations for their, their challenges that they face uh, and to help them feel that way when we are spending time with them to offer guys. And, and as, as Dr. Zanskis mentioned, not just from an administrative advising role. Okay, well, here's your schedule. Here's what you've completed. Here's the courses that's left. So I can give you your pin so that you can go ahead and, and enroll you know, for the next semester, but also having check-ins with the students and sort of getting a sense of how they really feel and that it, it was a, a, a positive experience of working with you. Um, and that's a really good point. Ayana brings it up in the chat too, as well as we're all representatives of the University of Memphis and touch points for students and good interactions help them feel supported and that support can help students persist. So it's a really good summation. Were there any other thoughts and ideas for any of you about your why? Um, why do you do what you do in your current role as, as instructors, um, advisors, um, in, in whatever your role may be, uh, and, and, and sort of what is your why in terms of that drives you uh, to do what you do in support of our students? Any of us would love to share. Dr. Hall, I would like to share. This is Shelby. Thank um, you. You're welcome. One of the reasons why I do what I do is because I really enjoy it. I enjoy serving the students. And to me, this is a, I look at this as serving them, being a servant to them, assisting them, um, helping them. Because some students come to uh, me sometimes, they're in distress, they're overwhelmed, they don't know what to take. Um, they're, some are coming because they're struggling in the courses that they're taking. So when they're coming, they come seeking answers. They come seeking help. So to me, I do it because I really do have a passion and a heart for, for the students and for what I'm doing. And I feel like as I'm helping them, I'm also helping the University of Memphis because as we show the students that we care for them, then it helps them to realize that, hey, I am... Uh, I'm in the right place. I'm, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing in this season and this time. And it makes them want to even do better than what they're doing. So it's really a matter of me just showing them that they can do it and that we are here at the University of Memphis to support them. And uh, hopefully they'll stay until the very end and complete the program, knowing that there's somebody here to pick them up, even in those moments when they feel like, hey, I, I want to give up. I don't want to do this anymore. This is hard. This is difficult. This is challenging. Uh, life is happening around me. Other things is going on and there's other places that I can go. But I feel like if we show them that, that we're serving them and that we are there for them, then I feel in my heart that they'll do better and want to continue to stay here at the University of Memphis. Wow, thank you so much for sharing that, Shelby. And it does, it, it combines with, uh, you know, the, the other comments from Ayana that we're all representatives of the University of Memphis um, when we're interacting with our, our students. And, and when we speak of recruitment and whether you're, I mean, we're in, in, in many cases, our best recruiters are current students in our yeah. programs uh, because someone is, someone in their circle will ask them, what is it like being a student at the University of Memphis? And, and our interactions with them go a long way of whether that response is positive or negative. And, and it's a perfect segue, Shelby, I don't think we could arrange it anymore. Uh, if Steve can go to the next slide, uh, because our students come to us with a sign that contains four words. And, and those words are, 
help me feel important. That when they come to you, uh, again, regardless of their background, their experiences, um, their familiarity with higher education, um, prior experiences they may bring from other institutions or even, you know, even within the university in itself, when they interact with us or, or, or you specifically, um, they're, they're reaching out and saying, you know, look, and whatever I'm dealing with and whatever I've, I've had going on this day, can you help me feel important, at least for, for these, this moment in time that we are spending together, um, that I feel valued, I feel heard, I feel appreciated, and, and that you took the time to make me feel that way. Um, that's one of the greatest outcomes of appreciative advising. You may not be able to help them solve the problem. You may not give them the answer that they seek, but in the way that you provided it, you help them to feel important. And, and that is the essence of, of, of appreciative advising that we want to be mindful of. So um, um, Dr. Zanskis has a, a theoretical framework um, that will sort of frame the second half of our, our conversation. Uh, and then I'll have a couple of other slides and then, then he'll, um, he'll, he'll, he'll talk about them a bit more in depth. Okay, thank you, Dr. Hall. Really it's getting down to is that the students matter and the relationships with students matter. So there's a theoretical framework for appreciative advising, and I'm not really sure how aware everyone is about the, the theoretical framework. I'm not going to spend, a, I could spend a whole three hour lecture on, on these, but basically that it's based in positive psychology and choice theory and social constructivist theory. And that informs the, the processes and the context so in terms of positive, positive psychology, it really is, you know, what, what makes life worth living? You're really looking at it in that sense in that appreciative inquiry is a, a strength-based process. Um, so focusing on the strengths and talking about, as we did earlier, talking about the assets that students bring with them rather than focusing on a, on a deficit base. The idea of choice theory is really coming out of Glasser and that individuals have the power to control. Really, we can control ourselves and we have very limited ability to control others and being more present focused and in the here and now as a context. And that something that happened in the past doesn't necessarily dictate our, um, our needs now. And then the social con constructivist theory and the idea of scaffolding, which I think Guyana um, pointed out, and this ZPD is Zone of Proximal Development from Vygotsky. So that's just really the difference between um, what a learner can do without help and what they can do and achieve with guidance and encouragement from someone like you who is advising the student. And scaffolding is just providing those activities um, in a way that it supports the student and they can feel led through that zone of proximal development. And then once the, once the student no longer needs it, just like a scaffold around a building, you can pull away and those things fade away as the student becomes more independent and uh, develops along that hierarchy. So that, that's the basic theoretical framework in the, the, uh, a minute and a half. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Zanskis. You're welcome. Uh, another, uh, another aspect uh, of, of appreciative advising is providing opportunities for students to have self-reflections, for, for them to pause for a moment to think about where they are, wh where, where they hope to be, and how they envision their, their enrollment in your degree program as a means to get to that goal. And so sometimes students can lose their way, they can get off track based on how things are going, what else is happening in their lives. And it's also, so it's, it's important also to make time, not that we have to inquire and get into our students' personal business, but, but for them to, to think professionally about where they are and where they hope to be, um, is that that is our role, to sort of get a sense of what are your goals, have them to reflect upon, you know, what, what, what do you hope to do after graduation? And, and what we often find ourselves, especially for those of you who are, are, are advising undergraduate students, there, there are many students who may see, you know, themselves coming to college. Uh, you know, I, I refer to it as some students just want to go to college. And, and when those who have the ideas of going to college just sort of uh, may just only be seeking that college experience for a moment. But if they don't have clear plans of what's going to happen after college, they can get bogged down in the college life and not really matriculate to the point of successfully completing a degree 
or successfully completing a degree with enough attributes, a high enough GPA and service credit hours and things of that nature to move on into the next phase of their professional life, whether that's graduate or professional school or even to be competitive in the, in the job place. And so it's important to have those moments of reflections to get students to think three years down the road, four years down the road, where they hope to be after their experience with us in our program, and then how they can then maximize the experience they have with us. And then the other aspect of self-reflection is important also for us as advisors to stop for a moment as well as reflect on, on, on our mindsets when we're interacting with students, when we arrange or schedule um, the, the advising meetings. Uh, and even in some cases now that we've learned a lot through the pandemic, some of those meetings may still take place virtually over Zoom. What may be different about that experience, but yet and still, even though it may be a virtual connection, how can we, again, reflect upon our experience with the students? Is our video on when we're interacting with them that, that they can see a smile on our face and can hear it in our voice that we're glad to meet with them and checking in and how they're doing. So for us to have a moment to pause and reflect ourselves, of how we can make sure we're in the right mindset, the right frame of mind um, to provide a, qualitative, a, a, a quality experience for our students. So the, the other aspect that we have, there's sort of um, six phases of appreciative advising um, that, that we're sharing with you. And, and part of the work that will we'll begin this process is looking at um, disarm um, how do we help students discover, help them dream, uh, help them plan and design their path, um, to deliver on that, and, and not to don't settle. Uh, and as we look at some of those definitions for those phases, simply, and as Dr. Zanska has mentioned, we are recording this session and it will be posted. The, the PowerPoint will also be posted uh, on, our, on our website for faculty, staff, resources. Um, but as we, we think about disarming, uh, what is the importance of first impressions? Uh, how do we create a safe and welcoming environment? Those does that that within the first minute of our interaction with students, do they feel like they're they're bothering you or disturbing you from something that's more important going on in your day, or can you set all of that aside and give them our completely uh, an undivided detention uh, attention? Um, how do we help them discover by asking open-ended questions to draw out of a students their plans, their goals, their aspirations, and making time to listen. Um, helping students dream by, by, by visualizing what they hope to become, um, what, what they hope to do with the completion of their degree uh, in which they're enrolled uh, in, in our college. Um, how do they then get able to design concrete, tangible goals that can be measured and, and, and actually documented that, hey, you've accomplished this milestone, you have reached this goal? Um, and then help them having a, a accountability measures in terms of in our follow-up meetings with them to hold our advisees accountable as they following up on their plans. Did they go to the tutoring service hours that they said they were going to do? Did they take advantage of the other resources that the university provides? Um, did they go visit the writing center to help them improve the quality of the papers they submit for their courses? All those things ensure that they're actually delivering on what they said they would do and then don't settle. Um, to challenge their our advisees to, to, to raise their expectations, especially if we're thinking and interacting with first generation college students um, who might not have, uh, you know, uh, who may feel in some cases that they're going through this on their own and, and, and dare to dream even beyond what they may be able to see uh, or those who may be within their circle of influence may be able to see as well for them to help them believe in that for themselves. So those are just sort of a, a quick overview of the six phases and, and Dr. Zanskis will now sort of expound, expound on them a bit more uh, with some additional practical examples. Thank you, Dr. Hall. So the, the first phase is disarm, disarm phase, and that really is trying to create that, that good first impression and creating a safe and welcoming environment for the student. And here are some examples of, and I, what I've done is I've tried to break down the phases um, by looking at some important advisor behaviors. And, for, and I understand that this is difficult to meet the students at the door and have a personal office that looks personal and inviting when majority of us aren't in our offices at this point. So I, I know that there's difference, but how do we accommodate that even in a virtual environment? So you, this idea of meeting students at the door, not having somebody just bring them to your your office and welcoming, welcoming them, introducing them, intru and I can't talk, introducing yourself 
to them and the sense of immediacy where it's both verbal and nonverbal. And I, you know, examples of things that are verbal are just calling that student by their name. Using inclusive pronouns would be examples of verbal kinds of things. Um, nonverbals are really just are your gestures and how do you look? Are you smiling? Are you looking at them? Do you have a relaxed body posture? Uh, are you watching the clock rather than paying attention to the student that's sitting in their office, whether it's um, a virtual office or in person? Um, removing a lot of the distractions and you know, how you're, even how you're dressed, I guess, is a way in your gestures. The vocal variety, do you talk in a monotone or are you able to be expressive and um, ask those uh, types of questions that would make that person feel welcome and that they aren't intruding on your time, but they are an important part of your time. This discover phase is really that point where you're asking positive open-ended questions and you're really trying to help understand the student's stories and your primary role here as an advisor again, is to affirm, rephrase, summarize what the student is saying. And I included some examples here. Um, describe three events that made you the person that you are today. Um, or since coming to the U of M, what is uh, something that you've accomplished that you are particularly proud of? And the idea is to, to get the person to, your advisee or the student to talk about who they are why they're here, um, and to demonstrate some interest, and also to help you build connections later on as you're moving through and progressing through these different phases that Bloom and her colleagues have outlined. Um, you know, in describing three life events that made you the person that you are today, I can give an example. When I was in middle school, I told my, um, my college, my high school counselor that I wanted to become an attorney. And he, he looked at me and, you know, I don't think he really saw me as becoming an attorney um, for a variety of reasons, but I, I would like to have been able to go back now and say, but I have my doctorate in, you know, counselor education, and I don't know if he would have expected that either. So I, I had that option, but, you know, that was an event, you know, it made me his, I didn't feel that he conveyed that confidence in me that I would have been able to go on. Um, given the background that I had or my uh, economic, socioeconomic status. So that's one of those things that helped me progress and helped me be persistent and move, move through that system, for example. And I'm sure all of us have examples of um, things that made, we are, made us who we are today. Uh, a less um, appealing example for me would be at a time where I was working my way through my undergraduate um, program and graduate program. And one of the jobs that I had, in, I worked in a grocery store. I worked in a number of odd jobs, kind of those dirty jobs kinds of, um, you know, the television show. And one of the jobs I had was cutting green fuzzy mold off of bacon and repackaging it for sale, which is a very gross thing, but it did, help make me who I am today. I decided at that point that I this is not how I wanted to live my life. And it helped me progress and persist through my degree program. So I can think of positive and I can think of negatives. Those are probably two more examples of negative uh, motivators, but I can also think of positives. And there are a variety of other questions that you can ask. And I, I can send out some information about that as well. In the dreaming phase, you're really, you're listening and what you've listened to in that discover phase, you're making the connections between that, what that student is expressing and where they can go and how they're going to go there. And you're really trying to encourage students here in this point um, to explore their options and know that there's more, more than one option and there isn't one single right answer. And an example, yesterday I was having an advising appointment with a student and they thought everything was black and white. They could either do one or they could do the other and they didn't realize that there were all these variations and options in between that might allow them to actually pursue more than one goal and keep their professional 
options available to them. But if had I not taken that time to listen and make the connections to what they were expressing, which was in part that they felt overwhelmed with the number of options, but at the same time felt they were constrained by the, the system that we were in, that they didn't have those options and explaining it was possible. And examples of this in a question would be if, if salary, education, and time weren't relevant, what would be your ideal job? Or another example is when you were eight years old, what did you say you wanted to be when you grew up? And what about now? So I had a, I was teaching assessment and counseling and I had a student and I asked this kind of like the career fantasy. When you were eight years old, what did you want to do? And one of the students um, told me that when he was eight, he wanted to be a garbage collector. And it was because he's a graduate student, but he wanted to do that because um, the garbage collectors were always friendly. They were outside and they waved at him when they drove by to pick up the, the trash. After he graduated, he came by, he left a note in my office and said, Dr. Zanskas, I'm still, I'm not a garbage collector yet. I'm doing these other things here and he's working as a professional counselor today. But asking those questions to try and get an idea of, at that point, they were working in the graduate program in counseling, but at another point, he had a much different perspective and, and view. At times, it's difficult for us to think about in terms of dreaming and in terms of passion. And um, Bloom also provided uh, the passion scale. Uh, so it ranges from one to 10, what I would rather have a root canal without anesia, anesthesia. And that's personal to me because I just had one last week, but I did have anesthesia. Um, to 10, my passion is so hot that it sets um, other people on fire in that range between there. And that might help scale that dream and whether or not that dream is something that is really, I would do it if I had to, but it's not really on my favorite things. And Ayana's put it onto the, the chat that it reminds her of designing your life series where one of the activities in the series is the good time journal where it walks students through questions as, they think through the sp what sparks them joy. And this really is, it is very similar. What is it that you really want to do? What really motivates you? Recognizing that can change over time. And, but also where are they now, in the here and now, where would they like to go? And how can we help them with that? So, I mean, you could look at this and I can rate a number of things um, even within the course of a, a regular job that there may be things that I would rather not do, but I'm very passionate about at the same time. So this is a helpful thing if you were trying to scale uh, a student's interest and in how passionate they really were about something of what their interests really were and where they lied. The next step is the design phase. And here are the things that we would do as advisors. We would use common language, easy to understand language and avoid the acronyms. Uh, again, in my background, it's in rehabilitation counseling. And unfortunately, almost everything is acronyms. So trying to break that down and not use those abbreviations and explain what things actually mean. It involves reinforcing a student and saying, that's a good question. So you're, you're validating when students have questions. And here, what you're really trying to do is make help that student make informed choices understanding what their options are, identifying or maybe providing some homework to help um, clarify what those options might be and making the, helping the student make their own decision about what they wanted to do and developing an action plan. It also can be involved making a referral, um, maybe con having, helping that student make that connection within the university with another faculty member or another program or another service. And how you do that, if you just provide somebody a name or if you you know pick up the phone and you contact that person and you say, I have a student that I would like you to meet and you make that introduction and explain why maybe with the student present it can make a big difference for the student and how that other person connects with them here. The deliver phase, that's actually the student's responsibility. So here um, it's the student is you review uh, with the student what they've accomplished um, during their session. You're setting 
responsibilities and timelines, but it really is the student's position to go and fulfill and do some of these things. We are there to provide confidence, reiterate our confidence in them, um, and to energize them and get them, you know, if excited about their whole process. And the types of questions would you might ask here would be how and when would you keep me updated on your progress? Do you have questions for me? Um, oftentimes I find we can cover things when we're in a session and then the very base, the last question that somebody might ask might be something that's already been answered, but it's almost as if they need reassurance that what they're asking is still an option and that validation that what they might be hoping is still available. It's the deliver phase. And the don't settle phase is really to push people to have not just to, to deliver, but to go to the next degree, to have higher expectations for themselves. And um, a number of our students, first generation students as undergraduates, um, maybe students that are coming from different socioeconomic backgrounds, um, parents who are in graduate school and who are balancing having parents and having children and maybe not certain that they are gonna be able to complete that plan is to set, have them set expectations and help guide them and identify where, what direction they're intending to go. It's a really brief kind of quick um, summary of each of the phases, but I tried to really look at more of things that you would do as an advisor in each phase. Um, another question that you would ask in that don't settle phase would, what would happen if you were challenged to, to become the best that you could possibly become? What would you need to do differently? So if you wanted to be that person that uh, you've always wanted to be, what would you have to do differently than what you're doing today? So those are just sample questions um, that Bloom and her colleagues had discussed. So I went through that fairly quickly. Um, but again, this is just an introduction to the process. It's not intended to um, make you an absolute appreciative advisor and expert in, in the field, but to give you an introduction so that you can begin to introduce or at least know that what you're doing is um, supported by the work of others. So the next question is, is what is the impact of all this on student success? What thoughts do you have around this with, uh, with our growth with appreciative advising and, and whether those of you are practicing these attributes or, or, or characteristics in your interaction with students, how can we engage more of our colleagues to ensure that we're doing so? So again, regardless of, of who the student is um, or their background or prior experiences may have been or their relationship or affiliation to either any prominent officials at, at our university, um, we want all of them to feel important. Um, and, and what is, may that impact be on student success, which, which is the ultimate goal? Um, how can appreciative advising in our service in this area um, impact student success? Just any thoughts, final thoughts or ideas you all may have, and then we'll open up for questions. Dr. Hall and Dr. Zankis, this is Jennifer Bubrick. Thank you. Um, I'm really enjoying this presentation. Uh, what does come to mind? Um, it's just the power of student voices. Um, you just mentioned about how can we reach um, additional faculty and staff um, in, in, in this. Um, and I truly do believe uh, this is what you've just presented, these attributes. Um, these reflections, you know, truly do um, contribute uh, to the success of our students. Um, the idea that I had was was like going back to what I said: the power of student voices. Um, <laughs> and I, you know, just an idea maybe in having uh, students come back and speak at faculty meetings. Um, you know, maybe even done in like small groups, so it's not so. I don't know, intimidating or, sure. you know, but um, there's so much power uh, to listening to the people we currently serve and the people that we have served. Um, so I certainly see um, that as being something that that we could do. Um, thank you. Thank No, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. 
Um, we also have in the chat that uh, first generation students um, especially need mentors and, and, and appreciative advising is an opportunity to, to mentor. Uh, and also understanding that when students have someone who will take time to invest in them, then success becomes more tangible. I mean, it goes back to that, those four words that every student brings when they come into our door or our offices or, or enter into a virtual meeting with us, help me feel important. And, and, and is be mindful of how do we do that um, when we're engaging, even if we're responding via email to a question and sometimes the student can be curt or, or dry or matter of fact, our responses can still go a long way to show an appreciation for them and what they're dealing with and what they're going through and can still help them feel important. So um, all of those are, 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 are just points uh, to ponder, things from which we should be mindful as we consider our interactions with students. Any other thoughts or, or chats regarding um, uh, the impact of appreciative advising on student success? Hi, everybody. This is Dini at Benton Court again. Oh, sorry. Um, I was just thinking about how it's probably more important than ever to think about these practices, given that COVID-19 is still rampant, that it's been rampant now for almost two years, a year and a half. And so I think, yeah. um, you know, we're, we're lucky to have medicine that's advanced, but I think, you know, like the pandemic is far from over and the educational impact that it's had on students is far from being over. And so um, I'm hearing in this approach that there's a lot of desire to humanize students and really engage with them where they're at. And I think that's going to be really important um, for our students as they're navigating all of this. That's a great point, Jeannie. Thank you so much for sharing that. And just the whole context of, of how everything was disrupted throughout the pandemic and how many of our students, you know, those who are already in online programs were able to persist online. But for our students who were in face-to-face -face programs and had on, on, on the ground courses, and particularly many of our undergraduate students who were really looking for a college experience, a lot of that got taken away. And, and particularly for some of our freshmen, uh, who came, who were freshmen last year, that, that transition, I mean, their, their senior year was truncated. Many of them missed graduations and proms. They missed having an opportunity to have a really on-campus student orientation or bridge program experience. And then they came in to learning in an online environment, which is for some of them was the last thing that they wanted to have for a college experience. Uh, and yet, and so it's like how can all the different interactions that they had with officials on campus how did we help them to feel appreciated or to provide appreciative advising, to encourage them to hang in there, to remind them that it's not gonna be this way always, and to help connect them with the resources and supports in place to help them be successful. And, and it's making that connection. And I know there were some students that I had a chance to engage with, and there was one student in particular said, this was not the college experience that I dreamed about. Mm -hmm. I mean, Dr. Zansk has talked about dreams. And you had students, particularly a first generation student, that had a dream of what it was gonna be like when he made it to college and would be on campus and did not had a completely antithetical experience uh, to that dream, um, how to help them persist and, and persist and manage through that. Um, it's, it's being able to listen and help them feel important and to provide all, all, as many opportunities as we can to help them stay on track and to be successful. Um, we have about a, a few minutes left with, with our session today. Um, of, there may be other thoughts and ideas that some of you may have about the impact uh, of, of appreciative advising on student success, but we also have time for questions. So there are other thoughts and ideas that you may have um, as we, we sort of um, draw our, our presentation to a close. Hi, I have a question. Yes. So I, this probably does not apply to undergraduate level, but for advising graduate students, specifically in the circumstance where the advisor themselves kind of holds the grad student's future in their hand, is there a, does appreciative advising have a theory for what it looks like? Or like, I, I imagine the goal is to make it so that no student ever fails essentially, but if you have a long career that's, bound to happen eventually. Is there a theory of how to go about, like if you have a student who really just does not accomplish the goals they need to accomplish, is there kind of a theory for how to go about handling that? I don't know if there's a theory, there's a, an, a, an approach. And 
Um, so not every, somebody may, many of us have had plans and many of us have, in life have had our plans disrupted. And it's what, how we approach that disrupted plan that really defines where we are. And you know, my example of uh, having wanted to go to law school, but now I'm a, an, an associate dean, that was not in an expected role necessarily. Um, my plan was to go on to a professional school, but that was a disrupted plan. And, and looking at when you're advising in, with graduate students, and it's a little different. They've made more investment in time. Um, they have a hat, they think they have a clearer idea of what they wanted to do, but it doesn't mean that that's going to stay completely static either. And, and looking at how life events, maybe an interruption doesn't mean an end. Um, there's not, that's not a theoretical aspect. I haven't, I haven't looked at that in terms of appreciative advising, but the idea that what have you learned from that experience, given what you've learned here, how would, how can we reconstruct your program of study so you can be successful? For some people, it might be that they really have determined that they aren't in the correct program. And then looking at, you know, what program might be a better fit, um, not fitting in one program in the, in the, university doesn't preclude you from entering another. Uh, I had a, uh, a doctoral student, for example, that for a variety of reasons decided that they no longer wanted to continue on that doctoral path within our program. But then it was talking with them and revising their plan, looking at where they were, given all the things that were happening during um, the pandemic, um, during the, the social conditions that were going on during the pandemic and the relationships with others, how could they, how could they still pursue their desire to have a degree? And what it came down to for them is it wasn't necessarily that they needed a degree in counselor ed and supervision, for example, I'm using that as an example, but they wanted a PhD so that that would give them more credibility in the community and helping them arrive at that decision. So that person um, did not stay in a program, but they did stay at the university and they're working on their PhD in a, in a different program. I still see that as a success, but sometimes it's taking that time. Again, it's listening, really active listening to what the person is trying to convey um, both with what they say in words, but also in the intent behind it. And it, it took a it took a several advising sessions for the student to finally recognize, Dr. Zanskis, what you've arrived at, what you've helped me see is it's not that I want this degree, but I want a PhD and it doesn't have to be in that area. That's not a theoretical approach. That's a very, um, just coming more from having empathy maybe some compassion in taking the time to listen to that student um, and their concerns rather than just being dismissive or that administrative person that just said, okay, well, here, here's your permit. It was taking the time to meet with them where they are today in that here and now and then moving from there. I don't know if that helps, Brian, but that would be my approach um, and an approach that I have used with students here. It really is getting down to the idea that you know, students matter, they are important, that they are important to at least somebody here at the university, and hopefully that's their advisor or their mentor, and that we can convey that and make them feel that sense of being important. And that's one of the reasons that people stay. And that, that doctoral student I know was looking at um, leaving the university and not pursuing any advanced degree at one point because of the the feelings that they were having. And that really wasn't truly what they wanted to do. So hopefully that's helpful, kind of a long answer, but not a theoretical answer. I'll have to look that up. Thank you. Are there any other questions or, or, or closing thoughts or comments um, regarding our, our session today? Well, hearing and seeing none, um, again, we'd like to thank you for your time this afternoon for joining us. We hope something was said and done to at least um, to, to spur your thinking.
um, regarding appreciative advising uh, to be reflective of our own practices in our interactions with students and to be mindful of, I think the, the ultimate goal is how do we help our students feel important um, throughout all of our interactions, even as challenging as some of them can be. And it doesn't mean that we have to agree with everything, but, but that we can still come away with providing an experience that helps all of our students feel important. Right? That is the ultimate goal and, um, and making sure we can do And so we thank you for what you're already doing in those regards. Uh, and we hope that sessions like this can just remind us to stay on that track um, and, and, and continue to encourage others to do so as well. Um, any other closing remarks, Dr. Zanskis? I would say that if there, is, if there is more information that you would like about appreciative advising, for example, Brian's asking, um, is there a theoretical approach or a, an approach to dealing with it rather than my more practical approach? We're happy to provide more information about the process, but we felt we wanted to at least introduce the process and in, introduce the concept of appreciative advising because of its value for our students and uh, makes the, it makes the work more meaningful for us and it makes the work more meaningful for students. And I just really appreciate everything that everybody is already doing. So thank you very much. Thank you. You all take care. Have a great rest of your day.